During the peak of American Rail, most networks traveled across the country from east to west. That is, with the exception of one that dared to go from north to south. That's right, in its time, the Illinois Central Railroad, the main line of mid-America, was one of only two railroads to operate from north to south. Yet despite its size, it avoided bankruptcy and lasted for longer than any railroad titan of its age, until ultimately falling upon the turn of the 21st century. So stay tuned to find out what remains, as today we discover the rise and fall of the Illinois Central Railroad. I'm your host Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Illinois, home of Chicago, was rapidly establishing itself as a noteworthy part of the United States, with its population tripling from its birth as a state on December the 3rd, 1818 to the 1830s. It was ready and willing to create its railroad. To this end, the state passed an Internal Improvement Act in 1837, permitting it to set aside $10 million to construct 1,300 miles of railroad across the state. These first miles of track were the birthplace of the Illinois Central Railroad. The first route was unofficially known as the Central Railroad. Its initial cost was estimated to be $3.5 million, but this endeavor set out to accomplish the unthinkable. Connecting Cairo, Illinois, at the southern tip of the state, to Galena, near the Mississippi River, not far from Dubuque, Iowa. However, the process was delayed for years, until a grant bill passed on September the 20th, 1850, providing it with 2.5 million acres of federal land. The land would aid the railroad in construction by selling tracks at a profit, and the railroad would agree to complete the proposed route within six years, and naturally, pay a percentage of the gross revenue to investors. This was the first time federal land assisted a railroad in construction, which would become commonplace as they extended west and was the key to sparking new interests. Sure enough, this was the spark needed, and on February the 10th, 1851, Governor Augustus French passed a charter for the Illinois Central Railroad. Illinois Central's first charter lines included the main line going north from Cairo through Clinton to Freeport before turning west and terminating at East Dubuque, which back then was known as Dunleith. Anyhow, this line ran 453 miles. The other line, led by a New England group under the direction of Robert Ranthal of Massachusetts, tracked north from what eventually became Centralia, reaching Chicago after 252 miles. However, starting the railroad took more work. To begin, the group needed startup capital to foot the bill, which was $26 million. They initially looked to Europe, specifically England, which had most of that continent's capitalists at the time. Well, that didn't immediately bear fruit. In their pursuit, they found several American investors. They eventually found overseas investors as well, and the project progressed since backers gradually became more interested after the first groundbreaking on December the 23rd, 1851. The first segment opened to Calumet on May the 21st, 1852, and the entire 705-mile Y-shaped railroad was ready for service by September the 27th, 1856. The opening of this railroad was special, outside of just Illinois. It was an engineering marvel. At the time of its opening, the railroad was the largest in the world. Its inclines were generally insignificant, but the closest comparison to its 705-mile length was the New York and Erie's 447 miles between Lake Erie and the Hudson River. While well, profits initially stagnated, there was hope on the horizon, as more and more people moved into Illinois, and Chicago grew into a metropolitan region, the Illinois Central Railroad became the first line into what eventually made up the railroad capital of America. Chicago was likely only able to achieve this status due to the Illinois Central. The Centralia-Chicago link was vital for its growth and vice versa, and hence, despite coming later, Chicago became Illinois Central's principal endpoint. Like many other railroads of the time, Illinois Central wasn't picky about its choice of cargo. The rails carried all kinds of freight, and while the banana trade from the Gulf Coast yielded the greatest deal of profit, the most crucial cargo was always coal. The Illinois Central opened the state's first coal shafts in 1855, eventually expanding to serve mines in Kentucky. On average, coal comprised around 38% of freight by weight, 
up and throughout World War II. However, around the time of the railroad's early development, a prominent historical figure appeared in the story. Perhaps the ultimate icon of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln. Well, not crucial to the Illinois Central for long, during his stint as a lawyer, the Illinois Central Railroad was one of his largest clients from 1853 to 1860, and it was during the cases he handled for the railroad that he gained the nickname Honest Abe, a reputation that helped carry him to the White House. As time passed, the Illinois Central Railroad looked outside the state's borders more and more. The first step was expanding further into Iowa to access more agricultural traffic and link up with Omaha, Nebraska, which at the time served as the terminus of the Transcontinental Railroad by Union Pacific, which was under construction. And so it was. The plan was underway with the lease of the Dubuque and Pacific Railroad in October of 1867. This railroad charted on April the 28th, 1853, by the time of the Illinois Central's acquisition, commanded a network from the 143 miles between Dubuque and Iowa Falls, with a branch to Waverly and aspirations to reach Sioux City, which the Illinois Central continued and eventually fulfilled on July the 8th, 1870. By December 1868, a $1 million, $50,000 bridge across the Mississippi opened Dubuque to direct service to Chicago through the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad, but this was only the beginning. A leadership change occurred before it could grow further, putting Edward Harry Harriman at the helm in 1883. Having already guided Union Pacific out of bankruptcy and expanding the railroad to the Southern Pacific extensively, Harriman also owned stake in the Chicago and Alton, Central of Georgia and Erie Railroad, among others. He brought the Illinois Central Railroad into its most prominent era, outright purchasing Dubuque and Pacific in 1887 and completing the route to Omaha in 1899 by forming the Fort Dodge and Omaha Railroad. But that wasn't all the expansion before the turn of the 20th century. Illinois Central continued spreading across Iowa, reaching Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1887 and Onawa the following year. By 1888, service to Cedar Rapids opened thanks to a branch from Manchester. Also, during this time, the company closed the gap between Freeport, Illinois and Chicago, creating one of its most important connections. Another subsidiary, the Chicago, Madison and Northern Railroad, began construction in July of 1886, just after its incorporation, opening only two years later initially clocking in at 112 miles, an additional branch to Wisconsin's capital, Madison, added 56 miles. However, this is somewhat standard for railroad expansion, and at this point, it wasn't much different from other lines. The significant change came after the Panic of 1873, a financial crisis that triggered a four-year-long economic depression in the states. Illinois Central managed to weather the storm, and as a result, its eyes turned towards the south, where it came upon several much less fortunate rail lines and an unparalleled opportunity. After the Panic of 1873, the New Orleans, Jackson, Great Northern Railroad, and Mississippi Central Railroad were financially ruined. Illinois Central swooped in, purchasing both at a bargain in 1877. This acquisition added 548 miles to the network, and the two lines were merged into the Chicago, St. Louis, and New Orleans Railroad in November. And the transformation was amazing. With the acquisition, there were now direct links to New Orleans via Canton, Mississippi, East Cairo, Kentucky, and Jackson, Tennessee. The only barrier between the Gulf Coast and the Illinois Central was now the Ohio River at Cairo. And hence, work began in 1886, building a 4,644-foot-long bridge across the river and three miles worth of approaches to the bridge. Within three years, and after $3 million spent, the bridge opened on October the 29th, 1889, finally linking the Great Lakes adjacent Chicago to the Gulf Coast. This was monumental. Illinois Central interchanged with virtually every major American railroad on the route, firmly establishing it as one of the top rail dogs entering the 1900s. The story of the downfall of the Illinois Central is not unique. In fact, many great American railroads have fallen, showing us that nothing lasts forever and that it's best to be prepared for every challenge life might bring our way. Thanks to the sponsor of this video, Policy Genius, we can now put our worries at ease. 
Policy Genius makes the process of finding good life insurance seamless. Their technology allows you to compare quotes from top insurers, giving you the best possible rates. And speaking from personal experience, as a parent myself, having insurance provides a safety net for my family. Knowing they're taken care of in unforeseen circumstances is priceless. You can easily compare quotes from top insurers, which is crucial because sometimes the coverage from work might not be enough or might not travel with you if you change jobs. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million in coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. But it's important to act now as buying life insurance will only grow more expensive with age. So make life insurance part of your financial planning this year. Start shopping now with Policy Genius to find the right policy to protect your family. Their licensed agents work for you, not the insurance companies, ensuring unbiased guidance tailored to your needs. So it's no wonder they've got thousands of five-star reviews across platforms like Google and Trustpilot. So take that step towards securing your family's future today. On a personal note, buying life insurance really changed my own family's peace of mind. I feel assured knowing that in the unlikely event something should go wrong, my loved ones will be protected. Save time and money and provide your financial safety net using Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash its history or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. Throughout the early 1900s, Illinois Central acquired several more lines, reaching its peak at 6,721 miles in 1929, with the last additions being the Gulf and Ship Railroad in 1925, which also happened to be the year of final expansions. And for most practical purposes, this form of the railroad would make up its final composition. The only addition came in September of 1968, when parts of the defunct Tennessee Central were purchased and included in the network. But it needs to be emphasized that unlike many other railroads during the 1920s, the Illinois Central put a lot of effort into improving its network, putting over $65 million into improvements around the Chicago area alone by the end of World War II. They also quickly brought on new inventions, such as the diesel locomotive and streamliners, which headed to the iconic city of New Orleans in 1949. In fact, the railroad went as far as considering experiments with steam turbines. All of these factors of innovation combined with a steady freight base and heavy coal traffic meant that this was one of very few railroads able to keep its head above water during hard times like the Great Depression not even filing for bankruptcy. However, it did not fare well after World War II with the declining in freight and the passenger business, not to mention the challenges it faced with competitors from its own market as well as other industries. Concessions such as offering services for truck trailers on flat cars and even splitting off into real estate development ventures by 1962 helped keep the company afloat for a time. Until 1972, when the railroad merged with the Gulf Mobile and Ohio Railroad, another north to south railroad, creating the Illinois Central Gulf Railroad, which in the process brought its track length to 9,500 miles. But by the 1980s, its expenses overtook its earnings. With the 1980s Staggers Act, the industry was primarily deregulated, allowing it to sell large parts of its tracks. Through the 1980s, it sold off most of its rails, bringing it down to 2,887 miles by 1989 and changing its name back to the Illinois Central. It continued trying to cut costs into the 1990s to some effect, even managing to eventually increase profits and buying out railroads such as the Chicago Central and Pacific Railroad in 1996, in turn regaining access to Omaha. However, this acquisition got the attention of the Canadian National Railway as a potential way to access the Gulf Coast, and it took over control of the Illinois Central on July the 1st, 1999, ending nearly 150 years of independent operation. And so, perhaps oddly, to this day, the tracks of the Illinois Central Railroad are integral to the operations of the Canadian National Railway, profitable even in the modern age. Metra still operates its commuter network to Chicago, with Amtrak resuming the Chicago-New Orleans connection as well. The Illinois Central Railroad was the backbone of American industry for decades, and in some respects still is. From Chicago to the Gulf Coast, it created a path rarely seen in American history, and its founders likely knew that fact. 
And so, perhaps playing its cards relatively close to the chest compared to the other titans of the age is how it survived for so long. And although it ultimately fell, even if it was the last of its kind to do so, its tracks are still crucial to commuters and freight alike. Its iconic trains and routes operate to this very day. And you can keep its story alive by clicking subscribe or sharing this video with a friend. Otherwise, until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.